Hello, um, I'm really happy to be uh, joined uh, today by uh, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and a graduate of the uh, Penn Law class of 1984, Mary Gay Scanlon. Um, I, we're very happy to have you join us. Uh, thank you. Happy to be here, virtually. Yes, indeed. Well, we're all we're all virtual all the time uh, today, at, at, at least at least at the law school. And actually, that. Uh, if I could start by asking you, because I think I, my understanding is things have changed over the last few months even, but what has it been like? Um, we all think about our workplaces. Uh, your workplace is the U.S. Congress. And how has that changed in the last couple months um, in terms of both uh, voting, uh, serving your constituents um, in this uh, unusual uh, remote time? Sure. Um it's interesting because I was speaking with members of my office just a couple days ago. There was something on uh, Twitter probably about what is the last picture before everything changed. And there was um, a night in early March when we had very late votes, but it had become very apparent that week that this pandemic was something really, really extraordinary and that everything was about to change. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a picture of um, some of the staff in our back room, the legislative room, um, and they're semi-socially distancing. It was a Friday evening, so they had some wine out next to the Clorox wipes, you know? <laughs> and so it's the last time really that everyone was in the office together because since then everybody's working from home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Congress has only been meeting um, when we have, um, thus far, it's been pretty much COVID legislation to vote upon um, because the building, the Capitol, is not built for social distancing. Anyone who's been there, it looks enormous on C-SPAN, mm -hmm. but you're really smashed in with people and particularly getting to and from the floor. Um, mm -hmm. They've shoehorned elevators into little corners and mm -hmm. you'll, you know, in ordinary times when they call the votes and you all rush to the floor to vote, you'll be squished into an elevator that's only five feet wide with about 16 mm -hmm. or 17 mm -hmm. members in the elevator. So a lot has, has to change. Um, I was really happy I had a forward thinking chief of staff who before the pandemic had said, you know, we really need the ability to work remotely. So in October, he had ordered equipment for everyone in the office to work remotely. And we got it online about two weeks before we actually had to start working remotely. So our office mm -hmm. was able to transition pretty quickly. We saw the guy who has the office next to me in the Capitol telling his um, staff to take their desktop computers home. Yeah. With them. But of course, those desktops were hardwired into the Capitol system. So <laughs> we weren't going to do them any good there. Yeah. Um, so it's so that's better. interesting if I could. So I didn't, yeah. something about the way Congress works. Uh, even oh, yeah. for your offices in D.C., there is kind of uh, individualization in terms of, you know, office organization, remote work. Um, it's not it's not a kind of one size fits all thing for the House. No, it's it's really interesting. So so I'm on three committees. I'm on Judiciary Rules and the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. And so we've been looking at a lot of those issues and coming from, you know, I worked in large law firms for a good portion of my career. Um, and Congress is still operating a lot like an old school partnership. You know, all the partners want to have complete control over something. And so they're not so willing to outsource um, hiring, billing, you know, all the things that the corporate law firms have been figuring out the last few years. But there's some benefit to standardization of practices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got into, um, I was sworn in, in in 2018, and all of a sudden, I had to have an employment manual for my office. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all different. Um, everybody orders their own water. So, yeah, there's there's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of same system, and that's one of the things we've been trying to push, um, yeah. that there can be best practices, and people should probably adopt them. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, so there was a lot of, of differences, and, of course, the average age in Congress is 67, I think. <laughs> so you have a yeah. variety of technological um, facility and mm -hmm. a lot of meetings still where they start and spend a lot of time saying, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, Sounds like the law faculty. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. there we go. Um, so it has been interesting. I mean, a lot of folks, we, we've moved very quickly online in my district office to, um, you know, being able to answer the calls and the emails remotely. Um, all the meetings that I had set up 
for our district week in March, we were pretty much quickly able to move online to Zoom because most of the nonprofits and, and businesses that would reach out are, are pretty um, facile that way. So it's been interesting to have this conversation, which really got politicized with respect to whether Congress could work remotely. Um, and it's kind of, you know, as often happens in Congress these days, you end up with a false dichotomy, which is you're essential workers and you should be working. Yes, but it's not our physical presence, presumably, mm -hmm. that is essential. And so what can we do to protect ourselves, our staff? You know, Philly got hit relatively early. So we were very aware of it here. Many of our colleagues from the middle of the country were not getting hit in the same way and were much more cavalier. But then also we're listening to different news sources now and to the extent that, say, Fox News was saying the pandemic is a hoax and you don't need to wear masks and that kind of thing. You see that played out on the floor with um, members of one party masking up, being concerned about having to come into Congress and members of the other party not masking and, mm -hmm. and saying, no, we wow. absolutely have to be here to do our business. So yeah. um, there's been that kind of interesting commentary on, you know, what news sources are you listening to and how fragmented it mm -hmm. is right now. Um, on the voting, then, so you were going in the, the height of the pandemic, you had to go to Washington DC to vote, but has that yeah. changed now? Yes, so just last week. So the third time we had to go back to DC to vote in the midst of this when Philly area was obviously still at the height of it and DC was building towards it. So, you know, you're trying to socially isolate at home and then you're trying mm -hmm. to socially isolate there. And um, voting is taking a lot longer. Usually you would have a vote series where you would go to the floor and then you would stay on the floor for, you know, five or six votes or something and then you'd be done for the day. Well, now you're basically being called to vote by homeroom. You know, they'll call A through C and then, you know, D through F or whatever. Mm -hmm because you can only have so many people in the room and still be safe. The, the house position has been pretty clear on that. And then they have to clean everything and then we do the next vote. So voting takes a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the first started being talk about trying to have remote voting of some sort, proxy voting of some sort, it's been an ongoing theme, especially among the younger, uh, newer members of Congress who are in a lot of ways coming out, coming out of the corporate world, the business world, the nonprofit world, where these things are much more common mm -hmm. um, and, and fewer people coming direct from say state legislatures. So there has been some pressure. We also have many member, newer, younger members who have children at home. You know, it's a much younger Congress mm -hmm. than in the past. So they're looking for some flexibility in terms of coming back and forth. So there's been a lot of discussion about, is there an opportunity to do remote voting Lots and lots of resistance to that from leadership because of security and because of the sense that people deal better together, are able to be persuaded, et cetera, if they're in the same mm -hmm. room. Um, but also constitutional considerations. So um, starting late March, I guess the discussions got serious about having to do something because of not just the, the spike in illness now, but the anticipated spike again in the fall. And we can't have Congress sidelined for a year or more. Um, so the Rules Committee put together a report on what are the various options, what are the um, constitutional implications. And most of it comes from, you know, the historical way, lots of parliamentary, um, arcane, whatever, um, the use of, what is it, Jefferson's manual? I should know this, but the, the rules under which the House has operated for a mm -hmm. long time. Um, the fact that quorum had to be defined um, and they've never used proxy voting for actual votes. They've used proxy voting in committees before this, and the House and the Senate does as well, but they've never actually used proxy voting for um, actual votes on legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but it was determined that that was probably the safest, low-tech way to go at this point in time, because we don't have the technology right now to wire everyone in and make sure that everything's secure, yeah. uh, although we may move towards that. Um, but so what got adopted last week after a lot of back and forth was that there is proxy voting for the duration of a duly declared pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and one member can vote up to 10 proxies for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a system of you have to um, tell the clerk 
that you are giving a proxy to someone, that person has to accept it. You have to have mm -hmm. explicit directions with respect to each vote that you're going to take. When you go to the floor, you have to announce who you're voting on behalf of mm -hmm. and what their vote is. And then they get the opportunity to say, no, they did the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pretty low tech, but yeah. trying to make sure that um, contrary to some of the arguments that nobody is giving away their vote. They're not yeah. delegating the- Does that mean, Congresswoman, process. does that mean, does that mean that there's no more kind of floor amendments or does it, does that change the debate? On um, the bill, there or? haven't been a lot of floor amendments in a long time. Well, most of the rules under the last Congress, I think all of the rules under the last Congress were closed rules. Um, there've been more rules recently, but we have not yet been in a situation with amendments, I think. Mm -hmm. Most of the legislation we've been voting on has been this, you know, torturously um, negotiated legislation to deal with the pandemic where, you know, the Senate leadership, the House leadership, and the White House have come to an agreement mm -hmm. on a lot of sausage, and it's got to, you know, rise or fall mm -hmm. based on what's been negotiated. So we haven't gotten into that, but we are about to because the appropriation season is upon us. So yeah. um, we'll see what happens there. But amendments do have to be submitted in advance, and they're made okay. in order or not in order. Um, they've told us to expect very long nights when we go back to vote yeah. in the next month. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I, I wanted Sorry. to- <laughs> Way I too want... much, yeah, but- No, no, that's, I mean, and we're, as I said before, uh, we, we're, we're dealing with that with, uh, you know, our own faculty meetings and how we can hold yeah. those. Uh, we, I think because it's not as important as what you do, we, we do hold them via Zoom live. And so we don't do proxy voting, we do remote voting, but uh, I think every institution is, is looking at that. Um, if I could ask you about kind of the major things that Congress has been doing and that you've been uh, deeply involved with uh, in a pandemic, this is of course unprecedented. And maybe if, if I could ask you the general question first before coming to the specific legislation, um, you know, kind of what is your view of the, the role of Congress and the national government mm -hmm. in a pandemic that hits so many of our communities differently, where mayors and governors are in some cases taking the lead on, on the rules that we are living with? Um, what is the role, in your view, of the of the national government, of the Congress? And then I'll ask you about some of the specific important legislation mm -hmm. you've been working on. Well, I think, you know, to the to the extent that we can get out, we could have gotten out in front of this, that would have been better. Um, I think there is a stronger role for the federal government that has been in place. We have not had leadership from the White House, in my view that we needed, there are tools that are available such as the Defense Production Act and the CDC, et cetera, that if um, the White House had been interested in um, getting ahead of the pandemic and straightening out the supply chain early on, that there were tools available that would have been helpful to be deployed, force those mm -hmm. tools to be deployed um, with more or less limited success. Um, you know. Congress and, and steering legislation federally is like steering an aircraft carrier. So it is not going to be nimble. And, um, you know, I do think it, that there have been some good decisions made, although they have exposed the underlying faults in our existing systems, but mm -hmm. not trying to set up standalone new programs because it takes so much time to do the regulations and the, you know, and get the staff up and everything. The effort throughout has been to push out money immediately, really pushing out money that can deploy, mm -hmm. be deployed locally to keep people afloat personally, you know, during a limited amount of time um, to, to allow our medical systems to catch up. I think that was the goal, uh, was to enable the nation to take a pause um, briefly at, while we geared things up medically. Now, that did not happen to be same extent that we hoped, and, and now because we've got variation in response in different parts of the country, we've got this kind of rolling mess. Um, so federal coordination, we have a federal economy. We have interstate economy. So um, there are things that it would be helpful if our administration was working on them. But in the absence of that, what we need to do to support um, the states and localities to undertake those things are, are what we've been very much trying to push out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been an interesting debate as well when aid has been withheld to states and municipalities with the goal of forcing them to reopen more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some real ideological battles going mm -hmm. on here. Do you, I mean, in the, does the House leadership or, or you or the committees that you're on, do you, um, 
talk and deal directly with state governors and, and cities, um, or is do you kind of look look more broadly across the you know, the national policy and then and then the White House uh, deals with the states? Um, there has no. It's been very representative. I mean, it's been one of the interesting aspects. Of course, there's been an extra focus on our home communities right now because there's so much trauma and distress and uh, and you know disruption and everything. So there's all kinds of meetings, you know, that were not occurring before, you know, daily meetings with respect to medical response and, and regular meetings with state and local officials as to what do we need. But all that gets funneled into um, the caucus and, and what legislation do we need to support folks on the ground. So mm -hmm. that's been very strong. Um, before the pandemic, we would have probably two one hour breakfast caucus meetings a week. Um, and it would be kind of very broad brush, but then you would see people in the halls and there would be other, you know, group meetings and that kind of thing where you would figure out what's going on or have your input in. Mm -hmm. Now, for the past several months, we're having um, always two two-hour or more meetings, um, additional subgroups having meetings, not necessarily committees, but the Progressive Caucus or the first-year legislators or, you know, folks from this region or that region. So hours and hours of this is what I'm seeing in my region and we need this from our next mm -hmm. um, set of bills. Mm -hmm. So it's been very, mm -hmm. um, very much trying to respond and seeing different things. I mean, the thing that um, there's always a lot of talk about the need for rural broadband and absolutely we need rural broadband. But the problem in my district is that it's urban, but we have a couple chunks where there is no internet service yet. There's blocks and blocks of the city of Chester that have never been wired for internet. But the bigger problem is that people, it may be out there and available, but people can't afford it. So we have all mm -hmm. these kids who were unable to move to online learning. We have yeah. people who can't take advantage of telehealth. We have people who can't apply for their mail-in ballot or take the census. Um, because while there may be internet service available, they can't afford it. So. You know, it's a different digital divide than just simply not being able to get access to the internet itself. Yeah. Could you, um, you alluded to this a few minutes ago, but um, there's a, an older statute, the Defense Production Act. Yes. Um, that I'm talking about with my students and, and uh, you, I, I've seen a speech that you gave and, 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 you know, where you spoke very forcefully that the act is not being deployed as intended or in the best way. And so if you were you know, if you were giving advice to a, to a future president in, in this kind of crisis, how can you describe for us what is the Defense Production Act and how should it, in your view, be have been used and be used in this time? Well, so the Defense Production Act, I, I think it was passed during the Korean War, and the idea was to, um, you know, streamline and, and make sure we had available the supplies we needed for um, making war <laughs> in that context. So now we've got a different war, but the same tools could be used here. And the, the immediate problem we've seen with the COVID-19 is we did not have a supply chain that would support um, a really robust response and protection. Um, we didn't have the PPE, the N95 masks that we didn't know were a thing before, but now you know we dream about them. Um, so N95 masks and gowns and gloves and sanitizer and ventilators. So all of that is part of interstate commerce and you can't just you know have someone in west philadelphia start making this stuff so we need a federal response to that the defense production act would allow that now the the president i think in late march did invoke the dpa but did so only in very limited context so he invoked it to um kind of strong arm a couple car manufacturers into making more ventilators it was used as a negotiating tool and there was a lot of rhetoric out of the White House about, you know, we don't nationalize industries. Well, nobody's asking you to nationalize industries. You know, but, but the fact of the matter is we didn't know where to get PPE. We have a situation that persists to this day where we have states and municipalities and first responders and medical systems competing against each other for limited supplies. So masks that used to cost pennies now cost eight, ten dollars and that's having a negative impact on our economy and a negative mm -hmm. impact on our ability to provide appropriate care to folks, including in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. So we really needed someone to take charge and say, where is this stuff? Can we increase production? 
and, and then make sure that there isn't price gouging and competition between folks who need it, someone to do, direct it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that could have been done, but mm -hmm. has not. Yep. Um, so this is, um, this is incredibly important and interesting. Do you want to, I, I want to ask you a bit about your own recent you know, path into Congress and all the important lawyering that you did in, in this area before then, but maybe on the statutory front, we've been t talking about a, an older statute that uh, has not been deployed uh, to its full extent, the, the DPA. Um, can you maybe share with us either one stat, one piece of legislation you've worked on in the last couple of months or are working on presently that you think is particularly important in addressing um, the, the public's needs in this pandemic? Well, I mean, we have been um, pushing the idea of how do we solve this issue of the digital divide um, and trying to make sure that we don't end up cementing it in as opposed to reducing it as we come mm -hmm. out of this. So I, I have a lot of interest in how do we make sure that our kids have the ability to move to remote learning um, and, and move forward in their lives because our, our, to participate in our economy, to participate in education in the United States in these days and, and fully take advantage of it, you need to have those abilities. So how are we going mm -hmm. to change that? So um, very interested in that kind of legislation. For our area, um, we've got, a, we're really at the heart of this issue of the disparate impact of COVID and the mm -hmm. fact that we're seeing um, our communities of color get hit much harder, um, both because they are the low paid essential workers that we're counting on mm -hmm. and because they lack health insurance or, or adequate health care and because of you know, just all the systemic issues that are there. So I, I think it, it brings a renewed um, need to push forward on these systemic issues, which of course mm -hmm. have now been greatly exacerbated by even more recent events. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that this notion of the kind of disparate impact is, is so important. We're seeing it in our education at, at all levels. Um, maybe just to transition, um, tell if you could tell us a bit more about your district, Pennsylvania's fifth, mm -hmm. which sure. is even in the way you've described it in this in this few minutes, uh, very very diverse from Chester to oh. the media, Swarthmore, and so speak a bit about your district, and then if you don't mind speaking a bit autobiographically, just about. What, um, what led you to run for Congress and, and what was that experience like in the last few years? <laughs> um, so PA5 is a brand new district, has only existed since January of 2019 because of Pennsylvania's historic gerrymandering issues. Um, it is all of Delaware County, which is traditionally, you know, kind of blue collar going out to horse farms. So that's pretty diverse on its own with some urban pockets. Um, and the district also includes a slice of relatively affru affluent Montgomery County and then a chunk of South and Southwest Philadelphia. So um, a lot of immigration population, immigrant population. Um, I've got all of the sports stadiums from the Chester <laughs> Union up to the Eagles and the Phillies and the Flyers. And the yep. not, much, not much going on there now. Yeah, yeah no, not this week. Um, but I love Gritty. Um, but um, I've also got the ports. I've got the Navy Yard, which is, I, I mean, in ordinary times, I'm very, very excited about the Navy Yard because that's under development. There's a lot of really interesting business going on there. Um, I've got the airport, I-95 and Amtrak run through the district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got some really blighted areas in Southwest Philadelphia and, and Chester and some of the communities along the river that were traditional manufacturing communities. I have the Boeing plant that manufactures Chinook helicopters. So right after taking office, I learned that the Army was deciding to discontinue manufacture at that plant. So that's been an mm -hmm. ongoing um, battle to try to retain jobs mm -hmm. there. Do you, uh, have last... the, do you have the refinery which caught on fire? Yes. Yes. Uh, last that's, a, that's a whole nother discussion. Refinery. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I mean, that's just an amazing issue of what happens when you don't have a plan for a just transition from, you know, a refinery that essentially um, passed its useful life because of the types of refining it can do, um, but is so contaminated after 150 years of refining that um, it's very difficult to put anything else there. Um, you know, people working good jobs, over a thousand people losing their jobs. I'm sorry, I'm getting um, 
commentary from our rescue <laughs> hound. It's a congre and, congressional dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not congressional. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, but, but then it was the largest air polluter in the city of Philadelphia and having a really adverse impact on health um, for <laughs> folks in the district. So at any rate, it's, um, it's, it's a really interesting, very diverse district. Um, in some communities, the average household income ranges from 20,000 a year to in others, I think it's Villanova, it's over 200,000 a year. Mm -hmm. so, and what, so what made you, you had a, you know, as, as I know, but you, yeah. you, know, you had a very um, impactful, distinguished career as an attorney and, and uh, we awarded you our Distinguished Public Service Award for your tremendous kind of pro bono leadership. Um, what made you uh, decide to run? And, and um, okay. you know, we're very glad you did. We're very proud of you. But what, uh, <laughs> what, what made you choose to kind of get into this incredibly uh, contentious political scene? And how has that been? Well, really, it came a lot from the kind of work I was doing. I was pro bono counsel at a national law firm based in Philly uh, for the last 15 years. And so I had the opportunity to work on a lot of public interest issues. I was working on voting rights. I was working on um, immigration cases. I was working on, um, you know, general poverty law issues. So a lot of things that were very much in the public eye and having the opportunity to do that, not just in Philly, but also on a national platform with national agencies um, working on these things like the Lawyers Committee and the Brennan Center and um, national immigration agencies. So, you know, having that opportunity and like many of my colleagues in the 116th Congress, um, the 2016 election was a mobilizing factor um, because so many of the policies that we were working with were getting upended. So irrespective of whether you agreed with the wisdom of the policies or not, people were getting hurt by these, you know, whipsaw changes. Um, the first year or so of um, the Trump administration, I was busier than ever. Um, one of our big projects had been with respect to the clemency 2014 initiative of the Obama administration. So providing clemency to um, folks who'd been in jail um, under the mandatory sentencing um, programs from the Reagan era, et cetera. And if they met certain criteria, they'd be eligible for clemency. So we had screened and filed petitions for hundreds of folks in that situation. And um, public, public finance attorney is working on this stuff too. You know, anybody can do pro bono. Um, so um, we eventually got 29 people um, presidential clemency. But so at the end of the Obama administration, between November and January, there were hundreds of these petitions to be pushed through. So we were working on that. We were hearing that the White House counsel were working around the clock. So we were hearing about clients getting out, helping them get out, that kind of thing. Um, once the immigration ban went into effect, the travel ban, we were working around the country to provide representation to folks as they were coming in, develop new systems to connect them to representation. Uh, then it was um, the upending of our traditional um, emphasis on who gets deported. So it had really been the bad hombres were getting deported or those had been the targets, um, people who had violent criminal records, et cetera. All of a sudden it was anyone who was here without documentation. So we were assisting agencies we actually helped write a manual called How to Protect Your Family and Your Assets in Case You're Deported. Because immigration lawyers and family law lawyers had really been working in two different spheres. And the, the case law, of course, is different in every state. So helping our, our consulates from other countries, particularly Mexico, navigate the different systems and, and helping families and parents navigate what happens if I go to work at the meatpacking plant and get picked up because ICE doesn't have to go find my kid. Um, so we were working on that. Then we had Charlottesville. We were working with the Lawyers Committee on how municipalities and advocates can balance um, safety and the need to oppose hate speech. Um, so just one thing after another mm -hmm. was kind of rolling along. And then we had, I was focusing a lot of my work on fair elections. So we had the Fair Districts PA movement going here. I'd worked election protection for a lot of years. Pennsylvania, of course, had had a strict voter ID challenge, and now we had a gerrymandering challenge in 2018, or 2017 going into mm -hmm. 2018. I was not planning to run for Congress. I had a job, I mean, pro bono counsel at a major law firm. 
Um, you get to throw very, very smart talent at some of the country's most pressing problems and you get paid. I mean, there are very few better jobs. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking to move off that. Um, but in January 2018, we had the decision that Pennsylvania's congressional districts had been so badly gerrymandered it had impacted mm -hmm. the right to vote. And the following day, the congressman who represented the district that I was sort of in, I'd been gerrymandered out of the middle of it, um, he ended up on the front page of the New York Times with a Me Too issue for um, allegedly sexually harassing an, in a clerk and then paying her claim with taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. So we went overnight from a safely gerrymandered district with an incumbent who had $2 million in his campaign trust fund to the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And I started looking at, okay, who's going to be the woman who is going to take the seat because it was very clearly a seat for the taking by a woman because of um, the president's past issues and then the overlay of, of the most recent incumbent. Mm -hmm. um, and I got in because I didn't see someone who I thought was the right fit for the district at that time. There were some younger candidates who, um, Delaware County is literally a parochial county. I mean, which parish did you grow up in? <laughs> so it's a place that really prizes some length of, of uh, time there. I'm not a native, but I'd lived here for 25 years and I'd served mm -hmm. on our school board. So I had a little bit, not a career politician, but at least a taste of, of what it would take. And after working in Philadelphia for 35 years and being in the region that time and then living in the county for 25 years, it just seemed like it was a possibility that I could do that. So, um, I decided to do it in the course of about 10 days, went from hell no to okay, I'm filing. Um, I actually filed February 1st. Um, we didn't find out what the new district lines would be until February 15th and three months later we had the primary. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it was fascinating. I mean, as a lawyer, there was a constitutional crisis literally every week. You know. Is there an appeal? Is there not appeal? Who's going to vote? Who can yeah. run? You know, where does everybody live? It was just one thing after the other. And then the, the incumbent resigned, I think, a week before the primary, trying to force a special election sometime over the summer, because that's a mm -hmm. tactic that happens, which didn't happen. Um, it ended up being in the fall at the same time as the regular election. But that meant that I got to run simultaneously in the old district and the new district, uh, yeah. which only overlapped by about 55%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I was successful in both and ended up getting sworn in one week after the election. Mm -hmm. So um, it has been breathtaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was not a student of Congress beforehand. I was much more interested in what was coming out and applying or defending mm -hmm. or overturning the laws that were coming out. So, um, you know, I'm learning the legislative mm -hmm. process as we go. Um, that's well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in the midst of this incredible first term you've had, are you also on the House Judiciary Committee? So you dealt with the impeachment uh, stuff up close? Yeah, I have the honor to be the vice chair of House Judiciary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, a motivating force, obviously, for me was trying to hold this administration accountable because mm -hmm. I did not think that there was... Um, observance of the rule of law in many aspects mm -hmm. of, of the administration. So um, yeah, that did take up some time. But in the midst of that, we're passing a whole lot of other legislation like the Equality Act, um, mm -hmm. the first uh, gun violence prevention um, laws in decades, reauthorizing VAWA, um, the 9-11 First Responders Fund. I mean, it's impeachment was extra credit over yeah. and above everything else yeah. that was going on. Um, I think the House has passed over 500 bills, maybe almost 600 bills uh, since uh, January of 2019. But yeah, I got sworn in early um, during the longest shutdown in American history. And then we proceeded to have the third impeachment in American history. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the first pandemic in a century. So yeah. let's just say it hasn't been dull. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and then you're, I guess you're in the middle of a, of your, you know, re-election campaign, I guess, as yes. we look ahead. Yes. So, yeah, yes. well, um, so we could, this is so interesting and the work you're doing is so important. Um, I would love to talk more. I, I, I know I speak for everybody here that as, as soon as we can have you on campus to talk more about this, we'd love to, to, to hear more and have you uh, 
um, talk with our students and faculty and staff, um, okay. many of whom are big fans of yours. But Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us and uh, be safe and, and thank you for the great work you're doing. Well, thank you for having me. I'll look forward to it. Mm -hmm.